Good day, everyone. Uh, Doug Robinson, Executive Director of NASIO, back to you uh, to provide a quick uh, introduction to our annual tech forecast for state and local governments. And with a number of folks uh, joining us today, uh, we'll let them continue to join in, but we want to go ahead and respect your time and get started. So I'm going to turn the introductions over to my friend and colleague, Dr. Alan Shark, for some uh, introductory remarks. Alan? Hey, thank you, Doug. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. This has really become the uh, Doug and Alan show for probably 11 years now, and we look forward to it just like you. So we uh, have uh, put together our viewpoints based on our research and both respective organizations in terms of what we see in the year 2022. It's really hard to believe that it really is 2022, and I'll talk more about that later. But uh, we were talking earlier, is this the 11th year or 12th year? I think at least the 11th year that we have done this. Um, so uh, we look forward to sharing our views and we hope to have enough time at the end for you to be able to type in your questions. So Doug and I have been doing this for a very long time. In fact, Doug started at NASIO pretty much the same time I did at PTI. So we're kind of unusual in terms of being perhaps survivors, antiques, We've had to reinvent ourselves many times over the years, and it's been fun, and we enjoy what we do. And working with NASIO is one of the great joys, the best staff, best research. Uh, it, they, it's just a great organization. For those of you familiar with NASIO, you know that. For those of you who uh, need to know a little bit more about CompTIA's PTI, then we hope that uh, you'll explore a little bit more of many things that we do as well. Without saying more, Doug, it's yours, and then I'll follow you. Very good, Alan. Thank you very much. Uh, I have uh, a, a lot of information to share with you today, and I'm going to do that very, very quickly. So I appreciate it if you would sit back and buckle your seatbelt. And we're going to move through this uh, very quickly. So get your uh, in questions ready in the chat if you have those. And we will talk about driving digital acceleration and kind of the theme for our 2021 study. And certainly we see that uh, moving forward in 2022. So let me talk a little bit about five or six different topics. I will start with our always uh, favorite top 10. Uh, this is 2022 prognostication. Uh, we survey all of our state CIOs, the groups that we represent of the states and territories in the District of Columbia. And in 21, late 2021, we had 49 state CIOs respond to this and provide their top 10 strategies and policy issues and management focus areas. And this is the aggregate view of that. No surprise, cybersecurity number one for the ninth consecutive year. And certainly Alan and I will be talking a lot about cyber today. Uh, digital government, digital services continues to grow and then solid number two, clearly impacted by the experience of citizens during the pandemic. And quite frankly, they are less than optimal and poor experience with digital services in many cases. Uh, and so I think we have lot to talk about there, broadband and wireless, no surprise, moving up the list. In fact, cloud service is dropping a little bit, but a perennial favor on the list uh, since uh, its introduction in, uh, in 2010, but it was the top three for several years. It's uh, really the major force of change. Legacy modernization comes back on the list. Identity access management is new to the list from a technology standpoint, but not surprising, supporting cybersecurity requirements and digital services to citizens. And that includes both uh, internal for state employees and external. So ICAM is gonna get a lot of attention, we believe, over the next couple of years. Workforce comes back on the list. Uh, enterprise architecture on the list for the first time, data and information uh, management, the data analytics piece, again, uh, on a perennial list, but usually lower, uh, about where it normally sits in the eight or nine slot. Uh, interestingly, consolidation and optimization uh, has been num was number one for, uh, for several years since its introduction in 2007. Uh, so we introduced the list in 2006. Consolidation, optimization, kind of rationalization of the IT environment was the number one priority of state CIOs for many years. I think you can see from the progress and maturity, it's still a focus area, but again, not as top of priority, top of mind as we've seen in previous years. I would point out one thing that is conspicuously absent from this list in 2022, which was had been on the list every single year since 2006, and that's budget and cost control. So we certainly have a lot more to talk about in that category. So budget and cost control are surprisingly not on the top 10 list from our CIOs uh, in, in this year. 
Uh, let's look at uh, the kind of the overall landscape of the states and how that impacts state IT. Clearly, I just mentioned increasing uh, state revenues and spending revenues up uh, double digits in some places. Uh, spending, again, dramatic increases projected in FY 2022 fiscal year for states given the previous years. And so the question on the table, of course, for CIOs and IT leaders is uh, what type of IT spending increase? And we've already seen indications of that in a number of states with some fairly hefty proposals from governors uh, in their budgets around increasing uh, IT spending. And so we hope to see those come to fruition. Uh, a lot of those have to do with, with broadband. And the other one still to be determined, of course, is, is the impact of the uh, rescue plan, the ARPA funds. Uh, still with final guidance coming out, states are still determining uh, how to allocate that over the next couple of years and the infrastructure money. The big uh, item there, of course, for states, two items. One is the broadband the $65 billion included in, in that bill for broadband and the billion dollar, uh, first time ever, billion dollar state and local cybersecurity grant program with 200 million allocated in fiscal year 2022 over that four year program. So that's a lot to, to, to talk about right there. We've had our own sessions just on that on that topic. As you can see, these other items are just a recap of uh, what we've seen over the years in terms of IT transitions, uh, moving to the from the owner operator model for the CIO organization, elevated cyber threats, more emphasis on digital government services, particularly improving the customer experience. Um, then it really comes from the impact of the pandemic. And then finally, of course, in the continuity of leadership discussion, as always with state CIOs, uh, current median tenure, about 25 months, 25 months for state CIOs. That will increase slightly before we hit uh, the November elections, but uh, 13 transitions in 2021. Uh, and there's your heat map for a quick view of that. Uh, in 2022, in January of this month, we've already had two transitions, a new state CIO in Wyoming and new state CIO appointed just last week in Virginia. Uh, so we've already started 2022 with, uh, with those transitions. So this is something we monitor, uh, keep track of, so we can uh, obviously provide information to the, uh, the marketplace on that. So let me go through some of the aspects of the top 10, and I'll quickly cover data from our 2021 state CIO national uh, survey that we do with Grant Thornton and CompTIA. We did this in 2021, and I'm going to provide a quick recap because many of the questions were basically looking at a future focus that we're looking at more leading indicators. What do you plan to do in the future uh, about these issues? And you can see, not surprisingly, we had a number of questions around the impact of the pandemic. Uh, and number one, uh, in in 2021 was increased attention on digital government services, moving up the list, continue focused on expand from work. Of course, with the investments in broadband, uh, that comes comes up. We're seeing, uh, obviously, of course, the increased use to, of collaboration, but again, that's become almost routine now and a, a high degree of maturity in a number of states around collaboration platforms. So I suspect to see that, that dropped and uh, legacy modernization to move up in priority, particularly as state Legislative bodies, which are meeting in session in most states right now, are making determinations on capital investments to improve their, their legacy platforms. So, again, focus on uh, digital government, digital services, expansion in that case, dramatic improvement, and bringing emerging technologies to bear in terms of automation and what states can do. Uh, again, another not surprising response from our state CEO, digital services. Uh, what did you institute? Again, 86% remote work becomes a regular occurrence uh, rather than occasional, or it becomes the, again, part of the rule rather than the exception. And many states are dealing with this today and really kind of struggling through the policy discussions of what the future is gonna bring. Are they really gonna stay in a predominantly remote uh, posture? Or are they gonna begin to provide some uh, policies where they're requiring uh, many of their employees to come back to the office state employees, which certainly has an impact on our whole workforce discussion for, uh, for the future. Uh, enhanced security and fraud detection around uh, web-based services as the states expand those. Many of you know they saw dramatic uh, increases in fraudulent activities, so in investments in anti-fraud, uh, more identity verification, more analytics around that. Uh, it's going to definitely be uh, the word of the day for any of those online programs. Again, not surprising response, although I was somewhat surprised at the, the percent that increased and accelerated dramatically. So in terms of the demand for digital government services, you kind of look at this and say in the donut chart of 
of our CIOs saw an increase in the need and demand for digital government services. Not surprised. Uh, the brick and mortar facilities were closed for many, many months. Some of them still remain closed in states. And so they're really relying on that digital channel. Uh, this is an area that states perhaps weren't prepared to handle in the magnitude and the volume and the scope of services that needed to go online. So that's something they're gonna have to address. Uh, and in particular, I think from a citizen standpoint, uh, the citizens were, were not used to doing business with state government in this way, in many cases. They're used to doing that as a consumer, and they found this, the citizen experience with state government to be frustrating. They found it to be convoluted. They, they didn't have a, one right door to go through. They had to understand you know, multiple uh, environments, multiple platforms, multiple interfaces, and it just wasn't as seamless and secure as they've seen in the private sector. So all these things are, are being addressed today by most states. They've taken this on as one of their top priorities, as you can see uh, from our top 10. And in many cases, the CIO organization is supporting uh, those state agencies. Again, a pretty dramatic response here on the biggest driver, a uh, better online experience for citizens. And again, this is uh, data from our 2021 survey and something that all states are looking at. If you look at their state IT strategic plan, you see this woven throughout all the states that this is what they're kind of focused on is how to improve this experience how to provide a better customer focus uh, how to improve the security and provide uh, opportunities for online digital identities that can be used across multiple state agencies and so you see some of our, our work and our awards focused on that in, in the coming years so that's important so uh, finally in the whole digital services space, we have asked this question for about the last eight or nine years, and it continues to change uh, as the positioning of these emerging technologies. Uh, I was uh, a little bit surprised to see low code, no code jump up to number one, but given the experience with the state agencies around uh, really accelerated deployment and accelerated digital services to citizens, low code, no code became a really important component uh, particularly as a number of the platforms that were developed around vaccine registration, vaccine scheduling, uh, they needed to be out in marketplace to citizen in a matter of days. Uh, in the case of uh, some of those, it was a week from discussion to launch. That's atypical, obviously, for government, particularly for state government, which would have taken uh, perhaps months to get those out there. But they were really exploiting the low-code, no-code platforms. Uh, and we, we put out a, an additional policy brief on that in 2021. So certainly look at the NASIO website to, uh, to pick up that information on experiences from states. Uh, AI was number one for several years, supplanting uh, IoT, Internet of, of, uh, Internet of Things. Uh, that was number one. But artificial intelligence came in strong last year at 65% of our respondents. And that dropped down to number two, along with uh, robotic process automation. We still see these to be very important to the continuing digitization of state uh, government services, particularly improving business process uh, automation with RPA. I see a number of states now adopting that, understanding they have to do that, and certainly has uh, an impact on the state IT business process and also implications for the workforce. So continue to look at those. And again, we've put a number of materials together as well as some research beats on the adoption of AI uh, in the states. And we see that bleeding into things like AI ops for infrastructure and operational activities in the future, uh, more than we've seen it in state government. So again, uh, track, track that with some of the work, but low code, no code, definitely getting a lot more attention today in the states. Uh, I'll end the whole area here with uh, this topic with uh, just a quick quote from one of our state CIOs, and I think articulated very well uh, about what happened during the pandemic and the enterprise focus uh, and also the speed uh, that they had to turn and pivot and move these things out to, to face citizen facing. So I think we're going to hopefully see this continue as we as we move on through the next couple of uh, couple of years, uh, particularly in 2022, more more activity in the digital services adoption and uh, maturity. Uh, cybersecurity, couldn't couldn't have this uh, webcast without a discussion of cybersecurity. There's certainly a lot of materials out there and a lot of discussion around this. This was just one question that we posed. And I thought it was interesting about the impact of the pandemic. Uh, what do you see states uh, going to receive more attention from the states in the next two to three years? I mentioned this, adoption, expansion of enterprise access uh, and management solutions. So the whole ICAM suite, both for internal citizen or internal employees as well as citizens. And you can see very close margins for the others when we asked them about the uh, the top 
mayors. There's a lot of areas that are going to get top attention if you look at how close uh, some of these percentages are. I would certainly uh, be, uh, be, be uh, trying to mention the zero trust framework adoption. Uh, yesterday, the federal government released their zero trust strategy. We've been uh, talking to them and monitoring this. This is going to be challenging for the states. But if you look at the elements and the pillars of zero trust and how they're going to uh, basically push that out across the federal government, a very analogous, analogous to state government in terms of their kind of federated models and what they can do. So again, we're going to see states really focusing on zero trust and see them focusing on improving their anti-fraud capabilities and more uh, identity verification activities. So if you want to watch some of these, these topics, these little ones I would look at that aren't on that list, uh, talent crisis on cybersecurity professionals, a continuing issue that uh, NASIO certainly talks about and is well understood by our state uh, leaders. Um, continuing threats with remote work, they're going to morph, get more sophisticated. Uh, the continued discussion around whole of state cybersecurity resilience, whole of state meaning not just a focus on the executive branch, but looking at the other branches of government, K through 12, higher ed, utilities, uh, the whole sector of the state, as opposed to state with, a, with, with the state government as a large S, but just the state in general, how can they all collaborate? And we're seeing a number of uh, states, again, adopt a whole of state cybersecurity posture, and that's important. And certainly plenty of conversation that Alan and I can have about uh, state and local uh, partnerships for cybersecurity. Uh, because that is uh, going to be critical for the future in terms of the grant program, but also that whole of state posture is having more collaboration uh, with state and locals because state states have, uh, again, uh, matured uh, along that maturity line and I think have an opportunity to help their local government uh, partners in a number of cases. Uh, broadband, uh, again, top three uh, this year moving up, uh, I think prompted by obviously the the broadband uh, gap experience during pandemic, the educational homework gap, uh, the need for broadband for economic advancement and just incentivizing more activities uh, uh, the, in a digital world, broadband is critical and the need for clear high-speed broadband. And these are some of the topics that uh, state CIOs see as being major challenges. And even with literally billions of dollars, not only from the federal government, but the states, there are still some policy challenges particularly around affordability, regardless if you have a broadband chicken in every pot and high-speed connection to every residence and small business, you still have affordability issues for those uh, that are really in, in, at the margin, whether it's a rural or urban area, and they have to make very tough decisions about what they want to spend their funds on. And it may not be broadband, it may be a critical situation. So that's a policy discussion states have to have, and certainly one of the continuing areas of discussion that we've identified and our, uh, our policy advocacy statements are around accurate mapping and the improvement of the, the, the mapping and the mapping uh, the algorithms that are used today around census tracts. So uh, we've you know made some recommendations and really they have to look at different state activities. So that's also a, a major local government area of, of interest. And then finally, let's wrap up with a couple of things around cloud, uh, data around cloud migration, cloud adoption. Uh, the states have all adopted cloud in some way, whether it's an on-premise solution or an off-premise third-party cloud solution. Those are certainly growing. We've seen data uh, anywhere from uh, one to 99 cloud service providers uh, serving states. And so we did a major cloud study in 2021 with uh, our partner Accenture, and you can get that for the NASIA website and talks in much more detail about cloud adoption and some of the challenges around that. So again, the majority of the states do have some type of articulated strategy. It might be cloud smart, it might be cloud first, it simply might be some kind of statewide migration strategy without a policy agenda, but we're gonna see that increase and we're gonna see more adoption of cloud services uh, across all the states. Uh, and, and predominantly, it's because they're moving from that capital expenditure, that CapEx model, to OpEx, and they want more scalability and flexibility, something they didn't enjoy with the crush of demands during the pandemic. They could not uh, move that quickly, and they needed to have a scalable and secure uh, or, uh, organizational model for services and platforms that they could use and one that they could recover from. So you see some of the data around uh, cloud services and what's driving that strategy. Ten years ago, the states were predominantly opposed to cloud solutions because they were concerned about their security posture. Now that has simply shifted 
where they understand that those cloud platforms, in fact, are most likely more secure than the on-premise environment that they've been running for years. So uh, they're looking to those for those uh, for those security activities. So that's important to uh, to look at that as well, the operational and the financial aspects long-term of having uh, this flexibility to kind of pay as you go in terms of cloud services for, for the states. Uh, legacy modernization is going to be a major topic during legislative discussions over the next few months in many states. Uh, and you can see here, post-pandemic definitely accelerated deployment uh, with more focused on exposing those services to online transactions and moving to more software as a service and outsource platforms. And that's certainly been the case in a number of states. And as these, these platforms get more mature and more robust, uh, then we're going to see more states being able to adopt those. That, that was a hurdle for, for many, many years was, again, letting loose of that owner-operator model was very difficult for many states. And now they've, I think, seen the light that they're going to have to move in that direction for a variety of reasons. One is certainly the, the lack of capital. The second one is around workforce, uh, and the lack of skills, capabilities, and disciplines. Uh, those folks are, are leaving state government or they don't have the ability to recruit new talent in there that can support these environments. So they have to make decisions to move uh, into a, uh, a greater focus on uh, those third-party solutions. And as they become more mature, uh, those are right for state, state adoption. Uh, and again, I think if you look at the uh, major lines of business uh, post-pandemic, this is not surprising. Uh, in most states, capital investments are defined by some dollar threshold. And if you look at this uh, uh, prognostication forecast for the next couple of years, majority going to the human services uh, entitlement programs and benefit programs, and of course, labor and employment, and most of those are going to be tied up in uh, unemployment uh, uh, insurance programs. And you saw certainly the major challenge with the UI platforms during the pandemic. So states are going to begin to invest in uh, modernization. And only about half the states you know, have really invested in modern UI platforms over the last few years. So we have a lot that needs to be done in that space to build out modern unemployment compensation uh, benefits programs. And so you can see the, the stretch cr across all that data from the CIO's perspective. And then finally, uh, just one last point and just to wrap up on state trends to watch in 2022. I've mentioned several of these, but certainly focus on the future of the IT workforce. You know, the three R's, recruitment, retention, and resignation, retirement. Uh, that is in full full, uh, full scale with many states. They're, you know, having a difficult time recruiting IT talent because of the marketplace, uh, their compensation level, the nature of uh, the perception of state government as a a, as a place to work in the IT space and seeing experiencing certainly the great the great resignation. So lots of data there about state employees. Uh, looking at prioritizing IT application modernization, certainly that needs to be done and we're going to see states be uh, focused on that and we're going to see more money that are built into that modernizing the IT environment across the uh, across the board. Uh, Program integrity, I think a, a renewed focus. If you look at the data, particularly around things like the federal uh, payroll protection, uh, 800 plus billion dollars estimates that at 10% of that or upwards of 20% of that was involved in uh, fraudulent activities and theft of, uh, of those benefit dollars. And so there has to be something that has to really strengthen the, the identity verification, identity proofing status for many of those online transactions. And then finally, my last point, uh, looking forward to 2022 is, of course, uh, 36 gubernatorial elections, 36 elections in November of 2022. And so we can only just uh, speculate on how many new state CIOs will be in, appointed in January of, of 2023. A uh, number of those governors are incumbents, so they will most likely pre prevail given the track record, but we'll still have a high number of transitions in early 2023. So that's my very quick review and, and uh, of the of the state IT landscape and the state of the states for 2022. And again, put your questions in the chat and I'm going to uh, turn this over to Alan for his comments on local government. Dr. Shark. Thank you, sir. Um, Doug, very, very helpful. I mean, sometimes we think we should make this a two hour deal. Um, <laughs> in yes. terms of you know, presenting one and then getting into the discussion that I think everybody looks forward to in terms of what we do. Um, let me um, bring up my slide deck if I could. I think I have to reverse this. Hold on. Are we good? 
think so, yes. I'm gonna talk about the view from the local government. And again, I wanna welcome everyone. I know for some of you it's morning, some of you it's lunch, some of you it's afternoon. And we are so excited that 470 people or above that have actually uh, registered. So um, that's good news. It shows there's real interest here. And I would say for, there are six categories. 2022 is gonna be a strange year, but a good year for the vendor community and hopefully for local and state governments too, especially in the areas of IT modernization. You're offering solutions in cybersecurity. You're dealing with customer experience, broadband, cloud services, and being an MSP. Because I think more local governments are gonna realize that they don't have the bandwidth that they would like, and they're gonna to have to outsource things more than ever before. So we like to say kind of happy birthday to us, We've uh, been together more than 10 years working together on the surveys and dealing with these kinds of briefings. We've now expanded to doing this twice a year. Um, and we like the fact that we try to foster collaboration amongst our various organizations. And we hope that continues and it should. This year has been rather interesting in terms of the headlines um, that we've been part of and been asked to respond to. And if you look at some of these headlines, almost all of them come back to cybersecurity. And one of the biggest fears that we hear all the time from cities and counties across the country is ransomware, kind of strikes fear in everyone's heart. And what makes things even more frustrating is that usually these attacks occur on a Friday afternoon or on a long weekend. And this is very intentional. So this is something that we're going to watch. We're hoping that zero trust uh, will play a better role in shoring up our defenses. We're encouraged with what we're hearing from CISA in terms of some of the things that they're talking to us about, you know, coming in and helping us, working more closely with the states as well. It's kind of like help is on the way. At the same time, I have to stop for a moment and say, is this not Groundhog Day? It feels so similar. In fact, it feels like it's back to 2020. The issues are so similar. The only difference now is that more local governments have money to spend than ever before. And if anything, it's now prioritizing, where do I start? How do I apply? And a bigger fear that many have expressed, if I'm a smaller jurisdiction, how do I make sure I'm not left out? What if I don't have the expertise to apply for some of these grants, or in some cases come up with a 25% matching funds, which in some cases are required. So we're gonna have to work through all these things, but it, boy, it sure feels, familiar of the last two years. At the uh, close of last year, as I always do, I do predictions based on our research. And there are 12 predictions for 2022. And very quickly, cybersecurity, no surprise, remains front and center of attention. I suspect it has been that way and will continue that for years to come. Cyber insurance coverage becomes a challenge. We're seeing more people reporting that coverage decreases premiums increase and it's harder to even obtain it. So there's a lot of challenges uh, for governments at all levels when it comes to cyber insurance. We believe that zero trust becomes essential to trust and we're happy to see that um, this is being pushed at the federal level and we get a lot of buzz at the local level as well. Um, cloud solutions become denser. Uh, we've realized the, um, the advantages of moving to the cloud. I think the pandemic has moved that along a lot faster so that we realize that there are so many advantages to having our stuff, including applications that are more readily accessible and also hoping that where it is being stored, there is even greater protections. And that is the hope of many localities when it comes to cyber protection. We believe that managed services will continue to grow. This is based on our research and talking to people. This does not by any way take away the responsibilities of the CIO, if anything, it makes it easier for them to concentrate on solutions and not worry as much about the day-to-day -day operations of where things are and how things are operating. So the CIO position is alive and well, but we also are realizing that it may make sense to have some of this stuff uh, outsourced or shared in which there is active engagement from a management perspective. Of course, we're gonna see more broadband expansion. We have to. The pandemic really revealed a, a greater digital divide than some people ever imagined. But whether they imagine it or not, it's a real problem in to bring society together. It's something that we have to spend time on. And while it's a state issue, it's even more so a local issue in terms of how do we 
connect everybody in our schools, in our work, and our overall cities and counties. Number seven, staff tech staffing insecurity. This appeared for the first time about three years ago. And we're using the word tech staffing and security in the sense to represent a number of sub issues. First, the great retirement, the great resignation, and the challenges of out of town and remote work where some localities are kind of banning that, or if they gave emergency uh, clearances for it to begin, they're pulling back on that, which we find is kind of uh, problematic in terms of trying to attract and retain talent. So this is going to be a real problem. I'm hearing about people where they're saying that they can't keep people, they can't find people. And for the first time, they're saying it's not always money. It's actually the burnout factor, putting in hours, feeling that no one really appreciates. There's a lot of soft management skills involved here. So it's something that's going to require a lot of attention. Number eight, federal support to the rescue. Yeah, billions are on their way. Um, we've had CARES, we've had ARP, now we have broadband and we have cybersecurity. So this is something that uh, we're gonna look at. We're gonna help our communities navigate this and find ways to make sure that the most deserving uh, have a chance uh, to uh, partake in these programs. Um, number nine, redefining and practicing emergency planning and recovery plans. This came about from many discussions that we've had over the past two years of people saying, you know, we really haven't practiced this, our stuff. And yet we continue to deal with adverse weather conditions and other kinds of events that have caused people to say, you know, I think that our, our coup plans, our recovery plans really need to be practiced. And I look at our fire departments, they're practicing all the time. And I see local governments kind of saying, yeah, we have a report. Yes, it's over there. Yeah, I'm familiar with it. But our feeling is as a best practice, if you're not practicing, you really do have a problem. And with all the changes going on, this seems to be something that requires more attention. Number 10, emerging tech expands. Similar to what uh, the NASIO studies have shown, we're getting more involved with chatbots and RPA and other forms of emerging tech. And that's starting to expand. I, I think people are surprised. This is not something that's just occurring at the federal and state level. It's actually happening at the local level as well. Customer first grows. This is this customer centric approach, especially when our city halls are closed or curtailed due to the pandemic. It's really put something out there that I don't think it's ever gonna go away. And that is this digital connection to our citizens. They seem to like it. And for all the digital meetings that we had to kind of pivot to in a rather short amount of time, that seems to be the norm. A combination of those who can come in person and developing policies for those who can attend remotely or virtually. So this is good news in terms of those who support the customer service platforms. When it comes to customer first, we're talking about departments and partners and the public. And then finally, number 12, tech leadership rising, keep the momentum growing. The accolades that we continue to hear from city, county managers, elected leaders, they're really recognizing for the first time, and perhaps one could say, it took a crisis for people to realize the am amazing roles that our CIOs, IT directors have played during the last three years in navigating us through this uh, crisis. When we look at our survey, and we're about to launch our newest survey for 2022 and beyond, we look at the priorities of the next two years. And this print is a little small. We're going to share the decks. So I'm just going to go over the quick highlights of a few charts and then we're gonna open it up for some discussion. You can see in the top 88% um, priority, cybersecurity, data loss prevention. Number two, launching or updating digital services for citizens. We know that is because of the pandemic. That's 48% followed very closely by innovation. And innovation always gets misunderstood. It's not always something new as it is a new way of doing something. An improvement in business processes which may or may not involve technology, but in this case, our folks are answering it with the idea of technology playing a big role. And in tied with that is tied with that is modernizing outdated IT systems. So that gives you a sense of the horizon in which local government technology leaders are planning ahead. Interestingly enough, when we asked about city county technology budget expectations and their only expectations or perceptions, 
32% saw an increase of one to 4%, um, 17% saw 5% or more, but almost a third said perhaps no change whatsoever, and 11% said a decrease of 5% or more. So it's an interesting pattern here. And this was taken before uh, the announcement of the broadband uh, bill, part of the Infrastructure Act, and uh, as well as the, uh, the cyber funding, which is rather dramatic. So possibly these numbers would change based on those new realities. When we look at city county CIOs, um, we ask about their cloud strategies. 43% moved on-premise infrastructure to the cloud. And we suspect that will continue. 42% uh, moved on-premise structure to the private cloud. So there's a lot of cloud movement and part of it perhaps is the definition. So 72% shifted from using a local version of an application to a cloud application or SaaS. 66% overall began using a new cloud application and 44% integrated a cloud application with an on-premise application via APIs. That gives you an interesting perspective that cloud is very much active and here to stay. The next question had to do with report use of managed IT services. I personally believe this is a growth area uh, for the vendor community as more local governments uh, are having trouble recruiting people uh, and realizing that maybe they should be spending their time in a more focused fashion and working with our partners on the vendor side to achieve some of the same objectives. When we asked about reported use, 37% um, said, yes, we're moving in this direction. 15% um, no, but they're considering, and 45% less than half said no, and no consideration at this time, meaning that they're pretty happy with what they have. I wonder how that will change over time. And then when it comes to priorities on the many fronts, in particular cybersecurity, one of the big areas, highest priorities, which is the darker color to the right, is better training for general staff. Again, this is cyber awareness training, um, modernizing defenses, further establishing a security mindset, and then accepting or adopting a security framework based on national standards, and then training of IT staff. That just gives you a flavor of some of the IT uh, cybersecurity uh, priorities. When asked about emerging tech impacting cities and counties, drones really came up pretty high, 44% was uh, something in production. Um, and then you could see the different colors, piloting, considering, or no action. Telehealth obviously has grown dramatically, uh, hastened by the pandemic. Automating technologies in RPA, 21%. Internet of Things, 18%. 3D printing, 12%. And 5G, 11%. Artificial intelligence, 10 So it gives you a flavor of how local governments are thinking about in piloting projects having to do with emerging technologies. The top priorities for bridging skill gaps would be number one, cybersecurity. Number two, soft skills, improvements to communication, collaboration, team IQ. You know, you've heard that old adage, uh, no one ever, uh, people get hired for their technology prowess. Um, they get fired for their lack of professional skills. And professional skills, soft skills are one and the same. This is now moving up the list as being more important than ever before. Emotional IQ is perhaps more important than IQ. And then cloud infrastructure migration uh, is number three. And then infrastructure improvements to network systems, re reliability and performance, and you can read the rest. One of the things that came out and got a lot of buzz amongst the press was in our last cyber survey, and we do two a year, we do one that's more generic for cities and counties earlier in the year. And then towards the end, uh, towards Cybersecurity Awareness Month, we do and release our city county uh, cybersecurity survey. And one of the questions had to do with our local government officials, the higher ups, excluding themselves from cyber awareness training. 25% let elected leaders opt out. And this really created quite an uproar. And we're happy that uh, that was picked up by the press because it's a lot easier for an association like PTI or NASIO to say things like that, that individuals might be more challenged to do. And I think it's caused quite a few people to rethink their policies because of the rationale. One of the things that we said in defense of not doing that is the fact that many of these political folks have very public um, IP addresses and email addresses 
and become even more vulnerable. And so there's a lot of educating and it's really troublesome when we have a group of people that are excluding themselves and hopefully we're seeing some changes where that is being addressed. Specific to cybersecurity, and I'm gonna start pretty much uh, at this point, um, we ask, as we've done the last couple of years, how would you rate the relationship between your IT organization and your state's IT organization in terms of information sharing, resource sharing, education, training provided by the state to local governments? Now, again, specific to cybersecurity. Um, the vast majority uh, kind of said it was poor or fair. Um, the smallest there, um, it, there's room to grow is what I want to get to. And one of the things that I hope to do, and I know Doug, we both talked about this together over the last at least five years, is how can we foster stronger relationships? Because I talk to state CIOs and they clearly want to help. It may or may not be in their job description, but we've seen enormous evidence where states have really reached out uh, and have hit a home run on many fronts, especially with cybersecurity. But more work needs to be done because there's so many localities. Uh, so we hope that we can figure out some mechanisms. Possibly the grant programs will help foster that. And as we come to a close here, these are the organizations that we work with. We love working with NACIO, um, but the other folks in our orbit have always been the National League of Cities, uh, NACO for the counties, ICMA, and more recently, last few years, the National Governors Association. So there is a group that have actively working together. Now, one of the things that I normally do every year is do my ins and outs. I'm gonna spare you, but I will say this in the slide deck, this is a kind of an interesting thing for you to look at. This is what we posted 2019 to 2020. And what's really scary getting back to Groundhog Day, nothing has changed or not very much. So I will include this in the slide deck and I will leave it here for discussion, questions. And again, a number of people have asked, yes, the slide deck, and the session are being recorded. For those of you who uh, have signed up, you'll have access to that information. So I'm gonna stop here and here we are. Um, and it's time for questions and comments. All right, let's scroll through here very quickly. And uh, certainly uh, Dale, I see, uh, looks like a couple of questions here, but let's look at this, uh, particularly along the lines of uh, looking for the uh, uh, looking for the slide decks. A lot of questions like that. So those will make available to attendees, including the recording. Uh, question about uh, if you were to advise a sales organization about doing SLED territory planning, would you recommend having territories with a combination of, of SLED and local accounts, which I think are the same, SLED, state, local education? Uh, is that, you know, legislative things. I think there are some clear differences there, but I also know that uh, that's been the, the practice uh, over the, the, uh, the, the past few years, particularly with a number of our corporate members, is focusing on the, uh, the state domain and the local domain as separate and separating it out from the federal. Many of them had what I would call public sector practices, and they realized they nearly needed to slice and dice those because of just the cultural differences, the financial differences, the budgeting differences, and what, what had happened and because you have to build those relationships. And in some cases, that takes a, a, a long time. So I know most organizations do have regional approaches. You know, they have an Eastern or Western director or whatever, but I'm not sure it's valuable to focus on, on local and state as a combined entity. I think you have to kind of look at those uh, and the buying power uh, there's just a lot more local jurisdictions and they just, uh, there are a lot of differences. Uh, people have heard me say this for a long time. If you've seen one state, you've seen one state. So don't make those generalities about what you learn in one state. And I think the same thing could be said for local governments in terms of their perspectives on IT buys and IT spending. So it, now in thoughts. No, I agree. Every, every locality is different. I mean, it would be nice for us to say, yeah, here's one way to do it. Um, there just isn't that kind of uh, example. Uh, I think the most important thing is if you have a solution, the strategy is how do you get that solution in front of people? And I think that is always going to be the greatest challenge. Um, this, you know, people don't want you until they need you. And so it's kind of like, how do you make sure that you are always you know, out there saying, we are the experts in this area, as opposed to knocking on doors. Um, I think the most important thing is to get 
in front of people. And you can do that through the state association meetings, working through NASIO, working through our group and working to other groups, developing relationships. Some of the state groups are really good and gives you a real uh, to the ground experience on what their needs are. And that's to me, the most important thing is figuring out where, where the opportunities might be as opposed to thinking about how do I deploy my troops? In a virtual world, it doesn't really matter as much. It's not the door knock because if they need you, wherever you are in the world, they'll find you if they know what you have is what they want. Very good. A uh, question here, uh, I think from uh, 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 John Thomas around uh, state CIOs, how much of a role do state CIOs have in broadband uh, declining? Uh, we've captured this data for a number of years. The last part was in our 2020 survey, and I think it was 23% of the CIOs. So only a quarter of them said they had prime responsibility for strategy uh, around broadband. Uh, that's clearly different than it was 20 years ago, certainly different than my term in, in state government. We had the clear lead, was actively involved in, uh, in the broadband discussion of both uh, you know, deployment, adoption, working with the carriers. Uh, working with the governor's office, all of that has changed. Uh, many states moved to uh, putting uh, a cross-agency broadband. I think the majority of the states have some type of cross-agency broadband uh, strategy group now, and that is not under the CIO's office. So you have it positioned in economic development, you have it positioned in the local government organization in the state, or perhaps it is actually a, a, a organization off the governor's office, uh, but is no longer the a primary activity of, a, of the state CIOs. The majority of them are involved. They either chair the broadband group or they're involved in the broadband group, but they're no longer directly involved in that. Now, again, there's certainly plenty of exceptions to that. Colorado and California, other large states, the broadband office is, is, is a component underneath the state CIO. Uh, we've actually seen that shift happen during the pandemic where it's moving more, gravitating more toward the office of the CIO uh, during the pandemic, uh, simply because of the focus on infrastructure deployment. Uh, so I, I don't think that's going to change the long term. I think, again, it's not going to be part of the CIO portfolio uh, as a direct uh, responsibility as, as it was certainly 20 years ago. Uh, Alan, question here, I guess, for, uh, for you on managed, uh, on managed services, uh, what, uh, uh, and I'll get this other one too, but the specific opportunities and managed services for local governments, where that's going to grow? I believe it's going to grow based on our research and based on our conversations with our members. When people are asking what can they do to shore up their cybersecurity uh, defenses, one of the things that keeps coming up is, I don't have the right staff. And it's easier for me to actually reach out to a managed service provider than it is to actually get another headcount. It's just the politics of headcount. And this is done at all levels of government. Uh, I'm amazed at the federal government, for example, for those of you who follow these kind of issues, the federal government always says, well, our headcount is less. We only have 1.9 million federal employees. Uh, the truth be known, it's supplemented probably about four times per staff of contractors doing things that normally would be done by full-time staff. In our situation, I think the managed service provider collectively can offer a better service, better quality of service, and ideally a more secure service than possibly some of the smaller, medium-sized jurisdictions could ever hope to do. And I think that realization is coming home and I think we're gonna see more people uh, inquire about monitoring or wholesale, just having the network operations moved over especially when people are confronting end of life of uh, infrastructure and equipment. Yeah, another question for you real quick, Alan from Steve on local government uh, survey uh, where they indicated their local government agencies, 90% uh, said they weren't concerned with ransomware attacks. Can you comment on this disconnect between perception and the reality of the threat? I don't recall saying 90% were not no, concerned. I, this was a survey that they did, apparently, oh, okay. the government agency. So yeah, I, I, again, I would, I would say <laughs> if they're not concerned that they ignore that on the, at their peril, that's my phrase for, for yeah. responding to that, yeah. Yeah, I was yeah. gonna say, boy, I hope that's not our survey. No, um, that, that, that it's the opposite, if anything. Um, I guess what it tells me is that there are a lot of people who think everything is okay. And, and that's really scary. There are others who right. 
are afraid to go home at night on Friday nights uh, because that's when these things occur or holidays. So um, they need some educating because that's not the reality of what's going on on the ground. Right, and you know, we, as we, states have been uh, relatively immune. We've had some recently, but states have been in a good posture. But you know, we talk about ransomware is, is a dramatic impact on the continuity of government. So the theft of data has become secondary, although it's certainly a new operating model. Ransomware is much more effective than any of the other uh, threat vectors uh, because of the way it's uh, de you know, certainly developed and delivered to any public or public jurisdiction. And it's become much more profitable for the bad actors to do ransomware than anything else. Uh, stealing data and trying to resell it in the marketplace is uh, not as effective as a ransomware attack. So they're gonna continue to perfect their craft. And it's simply, it's just a very good operating and a business model to do that. So we just see it growing and becoming more sophisticated and more problematic for all jurisdictions, but particularly local government and K through 12 because in healthcare, they have been the, the major targets over the last few years with the ransomware. So. We continue to monitor that. And if I could add to that, I think what's new uh, in the last year, and you're right, they're always adjusting to maximize their business case. It used to be, I believed, perhaps naively, that they had a code just like the mafia had a code. And the code was if somebody paid, that it was the expectation that yes, um, the, the cyber criminal would uh, release the data back um, because if they didn't, you know, no one would ever pay a ransom. So the code here was, We'll pay. Now we're hearing that people are getting this off the shelf stuff and they're amateurs and they're getting into the game. And, you know, who are we to figure out who are the amateurs and who aren't? Um, because we're now hearing cases of people paying and the system has not been released, sometimes unintentionally. They've got so many things going on, they lost the keys or they moved shop somewhere. Um, and as the bigger players are saying, they're spoiling it for us. So that's one thing that I think is really a, a game changer in that. The second is not just that they're freezing data, but they're forcing um, by people to, to pay by releasing sensitive information that they've already taken. And that just puts further pressure. Uh, in the case of DC, we had the police department have very sensitive issues and records exposed uh, towards pressuring them to pay the ransomware. So those, they are adopting. Yeah, they, 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 are, they are agile and, and flexible in their approaches too, so I can continue to change. A lot of questions coming in the chat, so we'll try to get some more here. A uh, question here from Rick about uh, breakdown cybersecurity uh, prioritization by category in the future. Well, for the CIOs, probably not. That's a macro view. However, for our chief information security officers, uh, we will do that to an extent in our upcoming uh, NASIO Deloitte National Cybersecurity Study. So that's a biennial study. So the 2020 study did look at basically, you know, what CISOs saw that they were going to invest in from their state. So you can look at that and you'll see a more granular uh, breakdown of what that is. But, uh, you know, I think my, I would not be surprised if identity and access management is number one, uh, you know, deployment of MFA, uh, you know, more stringent identity verification, the whole area of essentially, uh, which is the, 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 the most prominent pillar in zero trust is really identity. So you can, you can deal with identity and spend a lot of time on those resources. You're going to be much better off in terms of your ROI. So I see that being uh, just kind of speculating, being the predominant area of a breakdown under cyber for, uh, for our state CISO. So the others will clearly uh, fall out in terms of what uh, the state policies uh, and, and what they can invest in. Uh, let's see here. Lots more questions here, Alan, coming in the chat. Uh, we have one on the... Uh, uh, so much will be money will be sent to cities and counties. How will the CIOs and CISOs work with municipalities to maximize use of federal cybersecurity dollars contained in the infrastructure law? Very good question. Uh, we've had lots of conversations about that. Uh, I would say uh, you know, to be determined because we haven't seen the guidance yet. So CISOs working on the guidance with FEMA uh, until that comes out. Uh, essentially, it's a simple process now is that 80% uh, of the dollars that come to the state will be uh, redirected to local governments under a competitive application process. Uh, so that's the that's the one thing we do know, 25% of, of that must go to rural areas as designated by the census, we know that. So anything that's in the provisions of the bill right now is the only thing we know. We don't know what the guidance and then each state will make a determination about what they will put in those, uh, in those application requirements in terms of what local governments, uh, the eligibility requirements of those local governments uh, with 
a relatively small amount, it's almost a rounding error, really, when you look at the bill, a relatively small amount in, in, in fiscal year 2022, and, and it's going to be late delivery, given that we haven't seen the notice yet. Uh, that 200 million, including we got to have a state match, I suspect that a lot, a, a lot of states are going to really focus on areas like vulnerability assessments and simply overall cybersecurity assessments from a cyber hygiene perspective. They're going to kind of want to know you know, what the situation is on the ground with our local governments before you start spending money on block boxes and wires and, you know, other technologies. So again, I'm just speculating now because each state's going to make, kind of make that up within the parameters of the guidance. Alan, thoughts on, on that? The one you, you've, I think, answered it fine. It's just the one thing that I'm asked all the time is, what should I do while I'm waiting? And, and the answer exactly. is, do an inventory. I mean, I'm amazed uh, people are waiting as if frozen in fear or anticipation. And it's like, no, this is a time to take stock of, of your weaknesses that you're what you would like to have. What is your shopping list? And start developing the rationale for it so that when the rules come out, you can see how they align with some of the different categories. You know, yeah. it's it starts with inventory control, asset management. You've got to know what you've got and what you don't have. And then you have a good picture. So I'd be doing my homework right now developing the rationale. So when those rules come out, you're going yeah. to be uh, much better prepared. Well, and, and your your own survey data informs that to a degree because they said their number one item was uh, I, more security, cybersecurity training for general staff. But well, well, there's an area where state and local governments are already collaborating and certainly could expand that collaboration in the future where the state might already have a, a cybersecurity platform and they have a licensed uh, platform that they're delivering to 10, 50,000 state employees. And that could be expanded to local government and that could meet their needs at a much lower price point, quite frankly, than they could do if you have 100 different small cities and counties doing it on their own. So I, I see there's where the state, the CIOs and the CISOs and the state uh, can collaborate with the local government is, is providing them opportunities from their large uh, contracts that are already in force. And that way it streamlines that delivery of some of those services. But again, I think all that right now is just speculation until we see the, the guidance and, and how the states can do that. Uh, so it looks like, Alan, we are exhausted out of our time. <laughs> Lots of good questions as always coming in here, but I think we've covered some of the, uh, some of the uh, major ones. Um, uh, and a couple other questions about, uh, about cloud. So we may be able to get to these. Uh, and uh, lots of continuing uh, conversation around the role of the state and local government CIOs. So, uh, Alan, I will thank everybody for joining us today and turn it over to you for a, uh, for a goodbye to everybody. Goodbye. Now, I want to thank you. Uh, we'll be back in a number of months, but the issues that uh, we presented are continuous. We're just taking a moment in time and sharing with you what our research tells us, what we're hearing from our members. We are totally engaged with all the folks that you can imagine, the associations and our state CIOs, local CIOs. So stay tuned. Um, we will have more information and we will share them through our various organizations. Thank you all for being here. Yes, and thank you, Alan, for sharing all your, your wisdom and information. 2022 is going to be a roller coaster again, so just hang on. All right, everybody have a great rest of the day and, uh, and enjoy your work. Thank you all. Bye.